Okay. Here we go. Uh, we are coming to find you, Marshall. Let me just see. I'm What's here. up, man? Uh, hey, how's it going? I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, I can't complain. Life is good. Man, I can't love your background enough. That is just... Look at like that, that, hey? Yeah, I'm at our, uh, our front desk of our clinic right now. Oh, yeah? <laughs> awesome. I have uh, two dogs, a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and a pregnant wife at home. And uh, the kids were eating quite a bit of sugar, so I had to get out of there. Mm -hmm. Find somewhere new. Mm -hmm. Good call, my friend. Good call. <laughs> so we've got a big German Shepherd here and a seven-year-old, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, that goes. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. yeah. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today and, and why you chose to take this path? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, a bit of background. I'm an emergency doctor. Uh, so... You know, I grew up here in Calgary, um, did my medical school here in Calgary, lived in Vancouver for a while, but I uh, did my residency here in Calgary too. And, uh, you know, going through medicine, starting residency, I was really into the kind of acute care medicine. So I liked the idea of people getting shot and stabbed and I'd fill <laughs> them up with tubes, I resuscitate them, I give them blood, I run codes, I say cool things like CBC stat, you know, um, that was like, I was really into that. Uh, and I still am like, it's, it's a cool job and it's very fun. Um, but as I was going through residency, I started noticing like this big, big disparity between the amount of resources and time and effort we were pouring into say like someone getting shot, uh, you know, someone gets shot, there's like 30 people there. Um, there's all the resources in the world there. We send helicopters to go pick you up and bring you back. Mm -hmm. Um, millions of dollars getting spent. Same thing if you have a heart attack. You know, we'll send helicopters to grab you. We'll bring you back. You have this huge team brought in the middle of the night. Um, there's like no end to the resources that we will commit to some of these acute medical issues. Um, and I think that's, I mean, don't get me wrong. That's great. Uh, and I, I worked for STARS for years. Um, it's a cool, very cool thing to do, flying around, resuscitating people. Um, but what I started noticing was that there's this huge portion of people with life-threatening health problems with serious diseases, a lot of people dying and we're not doing much. And so if someone comes in with like an infection, no holds barred, I'm going like doing everything I possibly can. But then if someone comes in with an opioid overdose, like they almost died, they're much closer to dying than that person with a UTI. And we're, you know, what I found we were doing in residency was like, okay, we reverse, you know, we use some Narcan, we wake you up. Um, we sort of say like, oh, you should stop using drugs. Like it's that easy. And we sort of give you a pamphlet and tell you to, you know, you know, good luck. Um, best then, wishes. You know, yeah, best wishes. And we'd see them back and I'd be like, you know, I guess that pamphlet's not really all that effective, <laughs> is it? Um, can you believe it? Believe we need it. to I research you better pamphlets. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Maybe we need like, new designs on them or something, I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah, it was crazy. It's like, these people um, are dying and they're coming in almost dead and mm -hmm. we're not giving them the same care as people who have other life-threatening diseases. Um, and during residency, you know, I have some personal lived experience as well. Um, you know, I have come from a family with multi-generational, intergenerational addiction issues. Um, and then during my residency, uh, sadly, uh, my brother, um, stepbrother had a, a lot of mental health issues. Um, and sadly, in my second year of residency, he took his own life. Um, and, you know, I'd say that for me, was a really powerful, I mean, I mean, obviously it was a, a, one of the biggest things that's ever happened to me, but um, it really made me look at our system from a, sort of a zoomed out perspective and start thinking like, what are we doing? Like, like my brother went to the eMERGE once and I think he probably got a pamphlet. Um, and, and I started thinking like, why are we not paying more attention to mental health? Why do we care so much about acute stuff and not long-term stuff, not chronic stuff? Why not addiction issues? Why not other mental health issues? Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of been like spinning around in my head um, ever since. And so, you know, with that kind of in, in the back of my mind, I'm consistently sort of looking for areas where I can contribute. I'm looking for like science. I'm looking for data. I'm looking for evidence that this works or that works. And I'm trying to find ways to take what works and bring it to as many people as I possibly can, people who need it. And so that's kind of like from a high level, my perspective is that I think a lot of really well-meaning people, really smart people, people who care um, are not doing as good a job as they could because the system doesn't set them up for it. 
So I want to work with the system or outside the system. I don't care how I do it, but I want the systems to get into place um, to provide people the help that they need. So you actually developed a emergency room opioid addictions treatment protocol. That's like yeah. better than a pamphlet. Tell us about it. <laughs> yes, that's the thing. <laughs> it's way better than a pamphlet. It's way better. It's way so better. much better than a pamphlet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so the, um, yeah, giving people pamphlets was driving me crazy. Seeing the same people come back and then eventually seeing them not come back and wondering if they're still alive, like, um, felt like more had to be done. Uh, I was actually at a, a Calgary Flames game um, with my friend uh, Rob Tange, who was on the show a few weeks back. And uh, we started talking about what's new, what's happening, where are sort of the biggest places that we could make an impact. And uh, he pointed me towards this, a new study, Gail Donofrio, um, believes out of Yale. And it basically showed that if we start treatment in the emergency department, um, people do way better. So the whole premise is like, instead of giving you a pamphlet and saying, oh, call this number or follow up here or, you know, good luck. You, like you might get in in a few days, like don't use until then, like, like as if you're not going to have horrible withdrawal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so instead what we do is we start buprenorphine or, you know, opiate agonist therapy right there in the emergency department. Um, and that's what they showed in this paper. And when I saw that, I was, I was just sort of like blown away. Um, I read it, I contacted the author, read everything else I possibly could about it, started taking courses on it and then developed a protocol um, for us to use um, in Calgary emergency departments. Uh, you know, around this time, other people were thinking around the same thing and I ended up partnering up with a, a larger group throughout Alberta. Um, and, I, you know, we've now created, what I'm very proud to say is the uh, world's largest um, buprenorphine prescribing in the emergency department program. So if you go to any eMERGE in Alberta and ask for buprenorphine, it is stocked in the pharmacy. The doctors there have been trained on how to give it. And you can start treatment like now, you know, I mean, you have to wait to see a doctor in the eMERGE, of course, but if you're willing to do that, you can get started right now. Um, and that was the goal. And we've basically empowered physicians, um, emergency physicians, urgent care physicians all across Alberta to do this. And we've treated thousands of patients. Um, and so, you know, I'm very proud of that. A huge proportion of patients who um, die from opi uh, opiate overdoses were in the eMERGE um, within the weeks prior. So we've got this amazing window to intervene. Mm -hmm. you know? That's a great stat you know, to know. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a horribly yeah. unfortunate, but it, it's yeah. good that we know that. I think the stat is, um, I forget the exact number, somewhere between 10 and 20% within the last couple of weeks were seen in the emergency department prior to their death. Um, so there's this huge number of people that we can, um, we have this window to intervene. And mm -hmm. plus, you know, not always, but a lot of people um, have an overdose, near-death experience, and it's kind of like um, shocks them into being like, you know, I want some treatment. And, people, you know, there's going to be waves where people are ready to be treated and they're not. And if they're in a place where they're willing to start treatment or, or they want is not willing, they want treatment and they, they want to start now. Um, we need to jump on those opportunities and we need to be there waiting with open arms, um, ready to give them, um, you know, the best treatment that science has to offer. Um, and the emergency department is somewhere that we were kind of like, you know, brushing this off. Like that's not my problem. Um, you know what? Any life threatening disease is the problem of the emergency doctor. And if your patient has a life threatening disease, you need to treat it. Um, so that's what we, uh, built the whole program around and uh, it's going very well. You know, um, like I said, thousands of people have been treated. The program is up and running now. And uh, I think emergency doctors are getting more and more comfortable uh, starting buprenorphine. Um, and so far, uh, you know, we've had great success. We have a question coming in Yeah, please. from, from Ange from Regina. What's up, Ange? Thanks for the comment. Ange asks, how do we advocate for this in all provinces? It's a great question. Um, I think you got to talk to the decision makers. Uh, you know, I think bottom up, top down approach, um, post on social media, any doctors, you know, ask them if they're familiar with it. Um, you know, in Alberta, we're very lucky that our regulatory framework allows us to do this more easily. So like we had to lobby pretty hard to get um, prescriptions just on regular prescription pads for buprenorphine instead of like a triplicate prescription and you need to do a course and like all these barriers. So what you what you need is to break down the barriers um, and that comes from the top down. So those are ministers, those are the leads of the health authority, those are the head of the emergency department, the head of the urgent care. Um, you know, any ability to send letters or messages to these people will be helpful. And then the second thing is the, the bottom up approach. Um, you know, if people want to be treated, um, 
they should be. And, you know, this, this bottom up approach, grassroots, social media awareness. That's what um, this is. Asking for what. Exactly. This, is bo- this is the bottom exactly. up approach right here. This is bottom up. Educate the people. Tell your friends. Um, you know, ask, why can't we get this in the Emerge? We should be able to. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's the only way to do it. And then you need a few local champions. You need people who care, who are willing to put in the hours to make it happen. Speaking of local champions, there's Ange, uh, Angie Hamilton. She's all the way from Ontario. She is the leader of Families for Addiction Recovery. Thanks for the comment, Ange. Yeah, I'm with you, 100%. Um, okay, so um, have you seen an increase in emergency room overdoses since the onset of the pandemic? For sure. Um, you know, the sad thing is the pandemic has made things worse. Um, you know, there's several sort of what I call shadow pandemics that are accompanying COVID-19. Um, one obvious is um, trauma. There's a huge amount of trauma, trauma on the front lines and healthcare workers, trauma in people's homes. Um, and of course, there's this other, um, you know, pandemic of uh, addiction that comes with it. You know, people treating their trauma, people treating their mental health problems. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, we know there's crazy data around the effect of social connections. If you're seeing your friends, if you're seeing your family, you're happier, your addictions are better, your depression is better. In COVID, what do they tell you to do? Stay Stay home. Now, don't get me wrong. I see lots of people with COVID. I understand the public health necessities. I get that. But, Mm -hmm. you know, we shouldn't underestimate the the kind of layover effects um, that are coming from this. And so have I seen more uh, overdoses and addictions? 100%. In fact, if you take like the baseline level of deaths in Alberta um, from opioid overdoses, and you look at the first six months of the pandemic, the like the baseline level went up, and the amount it went up above the baseline is more than the total deaths from COVID during that same time frame. That's crazy. That's sad. Um, you know, more people died from being home alone than died from COVID. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't isolate. I'm not saying anything like that, mm-hmm. but. Uh, I think we need to be aware of the effects of social isolation um, and be aware that it does cause deaths. Um, and a lot of people um, suffering from addiction issues are dying um, because they're home alone. They're not like, mm, you know, I, ideally, if people are going to use harm reduction, use with other people, um, use it in a public setting, use somewhere where there's Narcan. Um, but if you're told you have to stay home alone in your room, um, you can't gonna just suddenly quit. Using. You're going to keep using, like, of course. Um, and there's going to be no one there to help you um, when things go wrong. Got another question coming in here. Um, Derek, thanks for the comment. Derek asks, does resistance training help? It seems to help me. Resistance training? Um, what I can say is that physical activity is one of the most powerful tools we have. You know, movement is medicine. If you compare head-to-head antidepressants to physical activity, um, they're about the same. You know, so like physical activity is as powerful as the best antidepressants that are out there. And the next best thing is that if you combine them, they're even more effective. They're more than double effective. They work synergistically. So there's lots of different studies. Is it cardio that's better? Is it, you know, gentle physical activity? Is it resistance training? Is it impact things like hitting a punching bag or running? Um, We don't really know. I think resistance training is super effective. I like lifting weights like whenever I have time. Um, And I think that um, the idea of movement is medicine. Uh, that's where the power is. So whether you're into resistance training or jogging or riding a bike or gardening, whatever it is, um, be active, get out there, move your body. Um, it will treat your underlying mental health problems. So let's take just a quick step back here. Um, when you're talking about your um, overdose protocol, uh, what was your success rate between the pamphlets and actually doing something? <laughs> yeah. Um, so... <laughs> If you look at people who get pamphlets um, and you look 180 days later, how many of them are actually um, receiving treatment for addiction issues? Um, the number is, uh, depending on the study, somewhere between 2 and 5%. It's pretty bad. Um, it's probably totally unrelated to the pamphlet. It's just like the background rate of people um, coming into treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you, and we just published this data, if you come through our protocol in an Alberta emergency department, your chances of being on treatment at 180 days. So not like, not like a few days later, we're talking 180 days later. That's a long time. Um, that means you're like, you're in it. Um, so our rate of recovery at 180 days is 61%. Um, 
It's a great number. That's a, a great lot number. Better than yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah, um, agreed. Um, what else can we say here? Okay. So, um, now let's talk about ketamine. Um, yeah. you've realized that ketamine is, is useful medication for treating mental health challenges. Um, let's talk about that. Yeah, uh, for sure. So kind of like when I recognized how powerful buprenorphine prescribing in the emergency department is, um, when I started learning about ketamine, I had the same kind of light bulb go off. Like we need to bring this to the people. Um, this is, this is amazing. Um, you know, the history of ketamine is pretty interesting. You know, it's developed in a lab in Detroit in the sixties, uh, started being used as a general anesthetic and it still is. Um, you know, people, when I ask, oh, has anyone in the room heard of ketamine? Everyone's like, oh, isn't that a horse tranquilizer? Uh, and it is. It tranquilizes horses. It also <laughs> tranquilizes people. You know, it's great for <laughs> as a people tranquilizer too. Um, but, and, you know, that's where I became so, like, I'm very comfortable with it because we use it in the eMERGE all the time. If we have to, say, like, intubate you, like, put a breathing tube in or do something else painful, put cut holes and fill you up with tubes, you know, mm -hmm. um, we use ketamine pretty much all the time. And the amazing thing is, if we use ketamine in these critically ill patients, and they all do very well, um, it's crazy safe. We can use it in people who are not critically ill, and it's going to be super safe. Uh, so all that is to say, like, that's kind of the, the history of ketamine and where it's usually used and why I'm so comfortable with the medicine. And, you know, we work with a lot of emergency nurses here at the Newly Institute as well, and everyone's super comfortable um, with ketamine. It's just, it's just such a safe, um, helpful medication. What they found, so let's get to the mental health part. Mm -hmm found um in the war veterans who were getting surgery those who were anesthetized with ketamine were waking up with less pain and less depression that's pretty cool it's like most people get surgery and have more pain and they have worse depression because they're stuck in bed they're in pain they're full they've been cut up they, they can't do anything usually surgery makes people feel worse but there's a subset of patients where it's realized um, why are these patients doing so much better? They're, they're war veterans where I was first figured out. And why is people's PTSD seem to be better? Um, and it was sort of all brought back to uh, ketamine. So once that was figured out, there's a pile of studies being done um, in anxiety, depression, addiction, PTSD. Um, ketamine's been studied in many, many forums and many, many studies. So in medicine, like if something reaches a point where we kind of all agree it's proven, like there's no doubt. It's not like one fringe study that showed this. When we agree that something is proven, we put it in a, a guideline and we say, here's a guideline recommended treatment. So ketamine right now, and we give it levels. So the higher, like level one is the best. You know, if something's level one, it's like antibiotics for sepsis. You know, you got it, or for like bad infections, you got to do it. Um, and ketamine, uh, as of 2020, November 2020, is a guideline recommended treatment, level one for treatment resistant depression. So what that means is that if you have depression, it's not getting better from everything else. You've been on at least two different types of antidepressants. You've tried other types of therapy. And They're resistance training. Really and resistance training, yeah, exactly. And you the pamphlet. And you, I even gave you a pamphlet. God ago, damn, you know? the pamphlet didn't work. <laughs> yeah, when the pamphlet failed, where do you go? Yeah. Ketamine. <laughs> yeah, well. yeah. So, you know, I guess all that is to say it's, um, in people who it's really hard to treat their depression, mm -hmm. ketamine treatment. It's very effective. Um, so that's kind of the, the history of ketamine and mental health. And there's there's evidence in all in PTSD and anxiety and addiction. Um, but really, it's a powerful medicine um, being used for a completely different thing than what we normally use it for. Normally, resuscitating critically ill patients. Now, um, treating chronic mental health conditions. And it's mm. it's pretty amazing that it's the same medication that does both. So, uh, does this require regular maintenance? Like are the effects of ketamine long lasting? Um, so that's a, that's a tricky question. The, the first thing is, you know, if you take an antidepressant, they say you may not feel the effects for like six weeks, you know, four to six weeks. Um, ketamine, you start feeling the effects basically instantly. So if you have a lot of ketamine in your system, you're a bit loopy. You know, we call it a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Um, but if we check your depression score before ketamine, and as soon as you're not loopy enough that you can take a score, um, your depression is better. It works like that, which is pretty cool. So if you give it to patients in the emergency department, 
it treats their acute suicidality. You can, you can, I'm not saying cure, but you can make people substantially less depressed within hours with ketamine and like nothing else does that. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and the next question is, is kind of where what you were asking about is the, how long does it last? Um, the truth is we don't really know the answer to that. Um, science hasn't really figured it out. What we do know is that if you have a single dose, uh, it lasts sort of days to weeks. Whereas if you have multiple doses and exactly how many over what time frame is a bit debatable, but if you have multiple doses, it lasts a lot longer, seems to last weeks to months, um, for some people years. Um, and then the last question that we really don't know the answer to is that if you take ketamine and use it as a catalyst, you get someone into an undepressed state, a state where they can finally start to love themselves, a state where they can finally start to learn skills, a state where they can finally get therapy. Um, you know, you, ketamine is a catalyst that gets you into that, that state of mind that you just couldn't get to otherwise. If we bring you there and then we give you intensive treatment, we give you all the therapy you need, we teach you all the skills you need, we help you turn your life around so that you love your life, you love yourself. Um, I believe ketamine is going to last a lifetime. Uh, and I don't think it's the ketamine. I think it's ketamine is a catalyst to give you everything else you need. Right. Um, and that's, you know, that's the model of, and we haven't really got there yet, but um, the Newly Institute, that's what we do. Um, that's what, uh, you know, we are treating the core of addiction. We're not saying like, take your buprenorphine and good luck. Um, we're making you uh, love yourself again. We're treating the underlying problems. And I think that is, um, is where the true power of ketamine lies. Uh, and if you talk to me in a year, I'll have all the data to um, prove that to the world. Uh, right now, I pull data from different places. Uh, this is super effective, that's super effective. And we have what's called biologic plausibility. You know, we, we believe with all our hearts and all our minds and all the best science in the world points to this being the most effective way to treat mental health. Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, and it hasn't been done quite the way we're doing it before. It hasn't been done in this intense outpatient model before. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you just take someone you know, you give them ketamine and you put on Seinfeld and you tell them to just like hang out and then come back and, you know, do it again later in the week. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not really doing any work on themselves. And yet ketamine works. Um, but not surprisingly, those effects eventually run out, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's when it lasts sort of weeks to months. But, you know, if, if you use the ketamine as a catalyst, mm, we think we can turn people around uh, or not turn people around, help people um, learn and discover everything they need to improve their lives. Uh, I got a question coming in here sure. from Carla. Thank you for the comment, Carla. Uh, she asks, are there any side effects? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so there's a few things. One is um, some people get a headache. Some people get nauseous. Um, and then there's a number of other things that are listed as uh, side effects that are actually probably therapeutic. So there are things like um, perceptual disturbances. So you may see walls moving. You may um, hear things differently. You may see different colors. Um, or you, you may get what's called synesthesia, where uh, your senses get kind of mixed up. So you can like taste sounds, and you can see um, sensations like feelings. So this is synesthesia, where your mind is working in new, interesting ways with new connections um, flying around. and um, those are listed as side effects, although truthfully, there's a lot of therapeutic benefit to being in that state and using that state to explore um, things you need to explore, to sort of dive into your psyche, to explore your own um, subconscious. People describe, sometimes when I'm on ketamine, I feel like I'm watching my life, like it's a movie in front of me. And without emotion, without like a, a big fight and flight response, I can actually look back through things that happened to me in the past and I can explore them. Um, I can learn from them and I can, I can move through them. I can process them. Um, and so some of those things are described as side effects. Um, but truthfully, I think a lot of the uh, side effects are actually um, therapeutic and, and can be um, leveraged for therapeutic benefit. So, okay. What's it like having people tripping on K at the newly? <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy wanted that to know about question. the K-hole. <laughs> that was yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's funny. Um, yeah, the K-hole. Well, uh, the K-hole generally refers to when you're 
in such a deep state that you're in like a black void. Like that's where I put people in the emerge. I have to do something painful to you. I drop you like deep into the K-hole. Um, what we do with the newly is we don't actually put you quite so deep. Um, so when you come into the newly, you know, you come in, our, our, our clinic is beautiful. I'm, I'm sitting here now. You can see the cool sign. Um, it, it feels like you're in a spa. It feels like you're in a very peaceful healing environment. Um, you kind of get brought to uh, your own treatment room, uh, a private room. There's plants, there's nature, um, there's nice lighting, there's a comfortable chair. Um, you sit on your chair and a nurse comes in, checks your vitals, talks to you about uh, what to expect. Um, we sort of talk you um, into what are called your intentions. So we bring you to a place where you can focus on what you need to focus on. You can explore that past trauma or a grief reaction or whatever it is that you need to work on. Um, we help you set your intentions for the session so that you can move through. Uh, and then we have you put on uh, eye shades so that you're not like, like just enjoying the light show so much you can't focus on what you're there to work on. Um, so we put on your, your eye shades and then you put on headphones. Um, and the musical experience, the, the auditory experience is a large part of the healing journey. Um, so what we've done for the, the audio is we have playlists that match um, emotional states. So there's these, there's these kind of grids that show sort of like happy, sad, tense, um, relaxed. And we, we basically have um, designed these custom playlists to walk you through different emotional states, bring you from a tense place where you're usually starting because you're a little bit nervous, um, bring you through areas of contemplation, areas of nostalgia. Um, and you end up in different places depending on the session. The sessions all have unique playlists. Um, and then, you know, we take that music and people often say that music like blew my mind. Um, it felt like I wasn't listening to it. It felt like it was actually part of my brain. I felt like it was like resonating with my brain waves. Um, and when people say that, I always laugh because I, then I, I bring up that actually it was resonating with your brain waves. Um, cause we do something else. We take what are called, um, biannual beat stimulation, which is basically what it is, is, is fancy, no fancy sort of term for this noise that you can make. And we know if we put this noise in headphones, put on people's ears, we can change their mood. Um, so depending on the type of biannual beat stimulation, we can actually um, change your affect. So what we do is we try to bring people to a less anxious state. So we take these playlists with all this cool music and then we layer on top and you can't hear the biannual beat stimulation because it sounds kind of like white noise, but we layer that on top in a way that you can't actually hear it um, and bring you through a journey. Um, so when you take ketamine at the newly, it's not like you're there watching Seinfeld, just waiting for the ketamine to kick in. Um, you are there to explore. You're there to work on yourself. And um, we tell you, you know, you may run into parts of your past that are um, hard for you to look at. Uh, and maybe there are things that have happened to you, things from your past that you simply can't seem to move through. They're holding you back in your life. You've done years of therapy and you can't break through them. Um, ketamine can help you break through them. You know, what it does really is it disables your intrinsic psychological defenses. So what that means is like, if I think of something bad that happened to me when I was a kid, um, if that if something comes up that maybe reminds me of it, or if I want to try talking about it in therapy, um, my brain may not let me. My amygdala, my center, you know, my fear center may um, go nuts, release all this adrenaline. I may get crushing chest pain. I may get like a tight throat and I won't be able to talk about it or think about it. My brain just sort of shuts off. Ketamine stops that from happening. So if there are things that you can't deal with, because your brain won't let you, ketamine will help you move through them. Um, and a lot of times during a ketamine session, as part of being in this calm atmosphere with the right audio experience, um, being directed to lean in um, to your issues, people are making breakthroughs and stuff that they simply couldn't work through before. Um, wow. So yeah, ketamine at the newly is like, it sounds like fun. Oh, we're gonna go like, you know, drop some ketamine. Um, <laughs> it's work, it's work. Yeah, you're not here to have fun. You're here to put in work. Don't get yeah. me wrong. It's most people say it's like very pleasant. Most people are like, I'm looking forward to my next session. Um, and it feels, it feels nice. You know, there's a reason people use it as a, a party drug. Like it feels good. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not the point. The point is the psychological growth that comes with it. And that's where, uh, where we take you and, uh, and again, kind of double down on the power of the ketamine. So, um, when we were talking, you mentioned that trauma actually can, can physically change the brain and Ketamine can actually change it back. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what I was just speaking about is sort of like the psychological benefits of ketamine. Um, but the, 
the biological aspects are are pretty amazing. So, you know, if you take this is a cool study. I, I like talking about the study because it just blew my mind when I first read it, um, and it's been repeated several times. If you take rats and you stress them out, so you you give them chronic stress, you're basically traumatizing these these poor rats. So it's, it's sad that they did this, but it is also fascinating. If you traumatize these rats, yeah, their brains shrink. Certain parts of their brains become smaller, like their medial prefrontal cortex has become smaller. Their amygdala, their fear center, becomes bigger. Um, and there's also fewer connections between their amygdala and their hippocampus where they store long-term memories. So all that is to say, their brains change. You know, you can dissect their brains and actually see physical changes in their brain. So and that happens to humans too. Humans who have been, um, you know, had a history of trauma, their brains are different. They don't work the same as other people's brains. And the changes, interestingly, are in the same areas of the brain that rats experience changes in their brain. And so the model is like, mm, translates pretty well into humans. So if you take these rats, these same rats, who have these brains that are not the same as other rats, their brains have been changed, physically changed. You, you can see the difference. And then you give these rats ketamine, their brains change back. The brains start to grow. Neurons form connections, synapses, where there were previously synapses broken down. They call it dendritic spine growth, which basically means these nerves are growing, these nerves are connecting, and they're connecting right where we want them to. So the chronic effects of stress that happen to your brain, they are reversed by ketamine. It's pretty cool. Wow. Well, having said that, why don't we look at an ad that we made and let people learn a little about the newly. Cool. The Newley Institute is Canada's first medically managed intensive outpatient program that focuses on the root of addiction and long-term phase three addiction support. As Canada's first and only interdisciplinary organization that offers medically managed intensive outpatient treatment, they focus on addiction, mental health, PTSD, trauma, and chronic pain. The Newly believes that mental health, addiction, and chronic pain treatment is in drastic need of a paradigm shift, and their vision was founded to provide long-lasting change within this industry, their community, and with their clients. By fusing a biopsychosocial spiritual treatment model, patients can overcome deeply embedded traumas that prevent them from recovering and living fully in their everyday lives. The Newly programs are based on evidence and data, but their approach is personalized because they know it is vital that people feel safe and supported as clients move towards wellness and recovery. This evidence-based program is designed for those who require maximum treatment benefit in a short time frame with rapid resolution of mental health concerns that are often the root of addiction. The Premium Intense Outpatient Program, IOPs, include approximately 140 to 150 hours of therapy by registered medical practitioners from many disciplines. The Newley's Calgary Clinic now welcomes clients, with clinics opening soon from coast to coast. Check them out at www.thenewley.ca or on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. Man, whoever's voice that was, was amazing. He was smooth. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a comment here. I just want to share and segue into my next comment that I'm going to make. Terry, thank you for the comment. Terry says, this is so interesting. I am captured by this conversation. I have so many questions. And speaking of questions, if you have them and you're putting them in the chat, we see them and we will do our best to get to all of them during the viewer's voice segment towards the end of the program. So... Let's talk about MDMA. Are you currently using MDMA at the Newly? We are not. Uh, so that's like the most simple answer. But the subtle answer is that we are actively developing um, research protocols um, and applying for exemptions for the ability to use both MDMA and psilocybin therapeutically at the Newly Institute. Um, so this is all underway. Um, the gears are turning and we will be offering therapy under one of those two umbrellas. So like the issue is MDMA is illegal. 
it's an illegal drug. You can't possess it. You can go to jail for possessing it. You know, um, unlike ketamine, ketamine is like an antibiotic or an opiate. Like you can prescribe it, but MDMA you cannot. Um, but you can't. I think pretty soon you should be able to. So there are two phase three trials um, out of the states. The first one um, was released, and I believe it was May this year. That show MDMA is remarkably effective for treating PTSD. And when I say MDMA, what I mean is MDMA assisted psychotherapy. So the MDMA itself is not the cure. It is the psychotherapy combined with the MDMA that is fixing people, is making people better. Um, it's helping people get through their PTSD. Um, so we have big plans um, for MDMA use. Our chief strategy offer, Rakesh Jetley, is in the MAPS training program. Um, and we are actively um, applying for grants and developing research protocols. Uh, so we are gonna be on the forefront of uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy in Canada. Awesome. So, um, why do you want to use it? What's, uh, what's the draw towards MDMA? Um, well, it's like, I'm drawn to whatever works. Um, so <laughs> like, I don't, I don't care what it is. If it works, that's where I'm going. Um, and the fact is, uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy protocols are just ridiculously effective. Um, you know, the phase three trial, uh, that recently came out, it is going to pave the way um, for um, a DIN number, which basically means that you can start prescribing it. Um, and it's going to pave the way to like, a, you know, an avalanche of treatment um, availabilities for people to get MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Um, and it's, you know, why am I drawn to it? I mean, similar to ketamine, there's a lot of really cool stuff that happens in your brain. Um, you know, like if w one thing that's cool is that all those changes that happen in your brain, you know, I was talking about the brain changing shape. Um, where the brain becomes physically smaller, it's also not functioning as well. It's not firing as much. So if you put someone into a functional MRI scanner, it doesn't light up in certain areas. Um, so in people with PTSD, your medial prefrontal cortex doesn't light up. Whereas your amygdala, your fear center, lights up like crazy, goes totally nuts. Um, if you give someone MDMA, the exact opposite thing happens. And so ketamine's cool, and then it makes your brain, your brain grow back, um, sort of over, you know, starting within hours and lasts for weeks. MDMA um, sort of immediately shifts the amount of um, firing of those neurons in those same areas. And so that, that creates this amazing window where your brain temporarily kind of shifts back to what it might be like if it wasn't traumatized and allows you this window of opportunity to provide therapy. And so it's, it's kind of like ketamine in that you can explore your underlying traumas in a way that you couldn't otherwise. You can explore your past and look at things um, without the same emotion. It's like basically the same um, premise with a different molecule that works in a slightly different way, slightly different receptors, but some similarities there. We know there's a lot of power in this medial prefrontal cortex. There's a lot of power in the amygdala and how the drugs, um, medications, I guess, uh, affect those areas. And so, you know, MDMA is cool um, theoretically because of those functional MRI studies. Um, and it's really cool, not theoretically, because when you do it um, with people, they get better. That's what's really cool. I don't really care how it works. If it works, I want to use it. Perfect. Um, so let's talk about mushrooms. You guys want to use mushrooms too. <laughs> you know, when I, when oh, I was yeah. talking, when I was talking to Rob, when he was on some time ago, we asked him about that a little bit briefly. And, um, mm -hmm. we were under the impression me and, and some of my colleagues and friends were like, well, they're probably micro dosing, you know, they're probably just doing a little bit. And, <laughs> and I might be wrong, but cause my brain has been through some stuff, but, um, I seem to remember him saying like, oh no, we give them like seven to nine grams and that blew me away. Like I, I'm, I would be afraid to do that much. Like I, I, I'd, <laughs> I'd do a bag and I'd see trees made out of freaking mustaches and stuff. Like, you know, albeit it was yeah, fun so and possibly very therapeutic. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we are not microdosing. No. Um, no, there's really no evidence for microdosing, Screw and the best studies available on it say like it doesn't seem to work. So, like, I don't think we know if it works or not, but the best evidence to date says it doesn't work. So I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, what I am interested in is macrodosing. Um, you know, the the dose uh, is 3.5 to 5 grams, mm -hmm. um, depending on which protocol you look at. So, so somewhere in that range, 3.5 to 5 grams. So not quite nine, but we're talking big doses. We're talking like all big the doses. way out, all the way out of their head, all the way. <laughs> yeah. We want you're, you to be out of there. You're getting rocked is yeah. what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so but that's what you do. And so instead of like, you know, a medicine every day for the rest of your life, 
Yeah. You have a limited number, generally two or three profound experiences with psilocybin that change the way you think, that change the way you see the world, that change your understanding of everything um, and help treat your, your underlying problems. Cool. So, um, well, let's talk about spirituality. Pardon me? Yeah. Do you want me to talk more about that? I can talk about that for hours as well. <laughs> well, I mean, tell us about some of the science. Like, is okay. So, like, we're talking about ketamine yeah. and MDMA and and mushrooms and yeah. all of these different things. Now, is the the not scientific part the same for all of them? Like, because all of these things they seem to uh, remove these intrinsic barriers that you're talking about, right? Now, is yeah. that sort of the same reason you use all of these different things, or is there a different method to each madness? <laughs> There's there's subtle differences. Um, that idea that these medicines allow you to explore deeply um, is pervasive across all psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, whether it's ketamine, MDMA, LSD, ibogaine, ayahuasca, you name it. Um, that's what that's what it's all about. Um, psilocybin is a bit unique. Um, and I'm very intrigued with psilocybin. So I've, I've actually applied for an exemption to Health Canada to allow myself um, as a therapist to um, go through experiences, to learn from it, and help inform future protocols. Um, so we have exemptions in place, and we're also actively developing research. But let's get back to the, the mushrooms itself. And like, what really happens to you when you do these like you know eight-hour deep trips, um, and how does that actually help you move forward in your life? Um, I guess the first thing is that like, if you go to the woods with your friends and take five grams of mushrooms, like you probably have some fun. You probably see some crazy stuff. You might learn about yourself therapeutically, but it won't be the same as doing it in a therapeutic setting. You know, you need the associated psychotherapy. You need to come in with intentions, with goals, where you want to go, um, and then let the mushrooms take you there. So that's, you know, there's a difference there. And I don't want people sort of saying like, well, um, mushrooms are good for me, so I'm just going to start using mushrooms because like they're pretty safe. They're, they're crazy safe. But, you know, to get the therapeutic benefit, you really need to do it with a therapeutic intention. So when you do it with a therapeutic intention, what actually happens in your brain? Um, there's this area of your brain. It's a network. So different parts of your brain all connect. And there's this network called the default mode network. You ever, you ever heard of that? I don't know. It's, it's kind of a, like a very nah, sciencey. I haven't. Yeah. Well, Sounds amazing. That's though. okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, <laughs> is there it a pamphlet? <laughs> <laughs> no. I would get rid of a pamphlet if there was one, for yeah. sure. I'd change that up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this default mode network, it's like, if it's your inner voice. So it's the voice that's talking to you inside your head all the time. You know, mm -hmm. it's also um, creates this idea of who I am. What is who, who what is myself? Who is who is Marshall? Like, where does Marshall end? And where does the rest of the world begin? What are the definitions of the walls around Marshall? That's what the default mode network does. Have you ever and done also, mushrooms? Uh, I don't talk about that. I don't talk about that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> mm. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I couldn't help it the way you were talking there. Anyways. Fair enough. Moving on. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the, this default mode network it controls all these different parts of how you how your brain how your brain works. When you take mushrooms, your default mode network like is down regulated, it sort of shuts off. And so a lot of things happen all of a sudden. This this idea of this voice, your inner voice, um, goes away. And so if your inner voice and, and so it, you know Interestingly, mushrooms seem to treat addiction very well. They seem to treat depression very well. They seem to treat anxiety very well. And it's like, why would they treat these diseases that are kind of like different? And one of the thoughts is that these repetitive thought patterns people have. So say for addiction, it's like, I got to have a smoke. I'm not going to get through this day without a smoke. I got to have a smoke. Where could I buy a smoke? I got I to gotta go have one. These kind of like repetitive patterns, gone, disappeared. And suddenly you can look at your life and your brain and think to yourself, I'm good without a smoke right now, you know, and just be okay with it in the present moment. Mm -hmm. The next thing is this idea of um, your default mode network controlling your past and your future. You know, thinking about your past, perseverating on past traumas, and then thinking about your future. What's going to happen? I'm so anxious. What's going to happen? So there's the first studies, the first modern studies, there's lots in the 60s, but the first modern studies um, on psilocybin were really done in patients who, people, who have end of life um, cancer, terminal cancer. And what was done is these, these people were given um, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy and uh, almost universally people felt much better about dying. They felt much 
um, they felt like they could accept it. And that's from two places. First place is that like the future is not actually a thing. It doesn't actually exist. All that exists is right here, right now, in this moment, in this second. Everything else is just exists in my mind. It's not actually real. It's just existing in my mind. And so that ability to focus on the now, that sort of radical acceptance of what is, um, is one of the benefits from psilocybin. Mm -hmm. And then the next benefit um, is this, this idea that Marshall ends here and everything else is separate from Marshall. You know, this is my, my walls. And these walls are, are sort of described as, you know, your ego. That's a Freudian thing, but um, the ego. And this idea that the ego goes away, these walls disappear. It's called ego dissolution. Um, that's, you know, one of the benefits. And the idea is if the ego constrains me to here and then Marshall dies, everything is gone. There's nothing else, you know, because that's this is all I know is right here. Whereas if I can accept that maybe where I end, um, something else actually begins. Maybe, you know, the molecules, the protons and neutrons that make up my body actually flow in and flow out. I'm actually part of nature and they go into other people. They go into trees. They go into the air. I mean, that's, those are all facts. Like we eat food that comes from somewhere, it turns into our bodies and then it gets used up and discarded and the molecules are moving around. And that idea that Marshall ends here is really something that our brains have made up. Um, and mushrooms uh, allow you to dissolve that ego and realize that you have more of a connection than you thought. Realize that you are connected to your environment. You are connected to your friends, to your family, to the people around you, to the people you've never even met more than you realized. Some people say, I realized um, that I am part of a universal consciousness. Um, you know, it's not just me who's isolated here alone and my death is not the end of everything. Um, things keep flowing, things keep moving, and I'm more connected with everything than I realized. And that provides people a lot of peace, particularly at the end of their life. Got a comment coming in here. From... Uh... Robin, thank you for the comment, Robin. Robin says, I am currently microdosing as my DMN is exactly as you've just described, Marshall. I wish I had access to macro dosing in a therapeutic setting. Robin, I wish you had access to it as well. Um, and I, I believe you will um, within the next 12 months. Cool. And I mean, like, legally above board. There's mm -hmm. places that will, will do this, but... You know, um, there's even places like here in Calgary where I know you can go have a guide take you through an experience, but the fact is it's still illegal. Um, and while I don't think there's anything ethically wrong in that, and it probably does help people, um, I want to be able to bring effective treatment to everyone. To the and doing things illegal are going to stop me from being able to bring this to everybody who needs it. And so I am 100% above board, 100% legal, um, and I'm going to jump through every, you know, every hoop I have to. I'm going to fill out every regulatory piece of paper that I need to until I can bring this to everyone who needs it. Amazing. So let's jump into some more spirituality. Um, you already sort of touched on it there, but I mean, you guys are using drum circles and uh, different things. Uh, how, how does a drum circle play into all this? It's fascinating to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a couple of things there. Um, we use a biopsychosocial spiritual model. Um, and sometimes that spiritual in the end makes people's kind of hair on the back of their neck go up. I'm not, I'm not referring to organized religion. I'm not referring to like biopsychosocial Christian model. I'm not like trying to sneak anything like that. By spiritual, what we really mean is this idea of, um, you know, being connected with your environment, being connected with those around you. This, I like that term universal consciousness. I'm not saying that's the only term, but this idea that there, is, there's, there are connections there that science doesn't understand. Um, I think that is an, an important, um, powerful thing. Um, and so moving on to drum circles, um, you know, I love drum circles. I do. Uh, have you ever been in one? Have you ever done one? I have. Yes. It's powerful, yes. right? Oh yeah. Um, you, yeah. You sit there and you kind of forget that you're like a human in this life with these problems. You're just sort of like feeling the flow, feeling the rhythm, connecting to those around you, um, through the skin of the drum. And so drum circles for me go way back. Um, I, uh, grew up, you ever see the show Dharma and Greg? I'm probably dating myself, but it's quite an old, like old sitcom. You ever, ever heard of that? Which sitcom? Sorry. Dharma and Greg. Have you ever yes. heard of that? Yes, I have. Okay. So it's like, there's the lawyer who's the dad or the, the male. And then there's the kind of like more fringy, um, Dharma, the, uh, the lady that was kind of like, 
my childhood, but in two separate houses. Um, so like my mom, um, ran a drum circle business when I was growing up. That's how what paid the bills, the drum circles. So I spent, uh, you know, Friday nights hauling drum circles into the community center, setting up the circle, jamming with everybody, um, hauling the drums out later. Uh, we did, we pulled them into corporate, you know, oil and gas buildings, trying to get, you know, sort of stodgy, uh, oil and gas executives to loosen up a little bit and connect with their environment. Mm -hmm. Um, this is what my mom did. She ran, you know, team building workshops, community drum circles, therapeutic drum circles. Um, so my garage growing up, couldn't park cars because it's full of drums. We drove around in a van we would call the rhythm mobile because it said circles of rhythm down the sides and uh, you know we'd sit in the back playing drums driving around it was hilarious that's amazing uh, so you know drum circles yeah they're, they're near and dear to my heart uh, they're they're like part of my you know my dna yeah. um the, the truth is they're powerful um and you know if they didn't work i wouldn't introduce them um to you know a modern medical scientific setting but the fact is they do um they allow you to connect to people around you without talking they allow you to have like group therapy um, and be vulnerable without having to talk about your past traumas. Uh, like I was saying earlier, this idea of social connections being therapeutic, this is proven over and over and over. Pretty much any mental health problem is better with connections. And drum circles allow you to form those connections. They allow you to form those connections in a safe um, way. And also, they're fun. They let you like blow off a little steam. Everyone leaves a drum circle smiling with a lower heart rate, lower cortisol levels, feeling better than they came in. Um, so that's why we use them here at the New Leaf. Last drum circle I was in, there was a guy in the drum circle. He had a Fisher Price, like a little Fisher Price, like a microphone and like a toy little speaker. And he was beatboxing into it. Yeah. And like he might have been yeah. the most into it guy out of every, because everybody, there's, there's a big drum in the middle, you know, boom, boom, boom. Anyway, yeah. He's off in the corner, just like, eh, eh, eh. so yeah, no, it, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> like oh, yeah. Nest Creek. Have you never been to Nest Creek in Saskatchewan? Nope. Well, maybe. It's fun. Um, <laughs> I should, yeah, yeah. So, the answer, yeah. Um, okay. So now, um, do you see the importance of uh, elders teaching and ceremony and, and like cultural things when we are treating um, indigenous clients? Oh, 100%. I think you would be remiss to not acknowledge the cultural importance um, of, uh, you know, all those things, particularly elders. So, you know, at the newly, we're actively developing programs to have in-house elders um, to respect indigenous uh, cultures and traditions. And truthfully, elders are probably the best therapists in the world. They have years of experience. Um, they know, um, you know, they know how to make the messages come across they need to come across. Um, and we would be, uh, you know, foolish to try to treat anyone with an indigenous culture without, um, without elders. And so we are actively developing programs for smudging ceremonies, elders, um, and other um, specific sensitive programs. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions that I have for you. Let's go into the viewer's voice. There is a bunch here. You ready for that? I don't know. I guess oh, we'll see. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, so we have Double T Ranch here. Does this still work? No, it doesn't. I used to have a whip sound for them. It's gone now. Anyways, uh, they ask, do doctors do this therapy? Uh, Sykes or who can access it? Um, so anyone can access it. Uh, when you come to the Newly Institute, you are seen by a psychiatrist. You get a full comprehensive diagnostic therapeutic assessment. We adjust your medications. Then you're seen by a doctor, either a nurse practitioner or a general or a, or a GP, a general practitioner. Um, we look at your, you know, your blood pressure. We look at your thyroid. We look at everything. We do labs if we need to. Uh, you basically get wrap around care. So we look not only at your mental health but your physical health. Um, and then your ketamine is prescribed by a doctor. It is then administered by a nurse um, who are trained in um, psychology as well. So the nurses have the you know emerged background for for some of them. Um, so they can take care of you physically. Uh, provide the ketamine, administer it. And then if you're needing support, we have psychologists um, who are at the newly available uh, to come in and help anyone um, if they need psychological support during their journey. Now, most people don't. Most people want to um, have their own journey and then explore it afterwards. Um, but we always have a psychologist ready to come in if you need a little support. And so that the answer is, this is an interdisciplinary model. Um, there are doctors, 100%. There are nurses. There are psychologists. Um, and everyone is involved um, in the role where they're best at. Um, so we, we kind of take everyone's skills, 
leverage them to the max and try to give you the best of all our people. And they go on to ask, if someone is using ketamine recreationally, does it still work the same? Um, good question. You know, the biggest concern is that it may not be ketamine. You know, it might be some ketamine and some meth or maybe some fentanyl or who knows, right? Like you don't really know what it is. Um, and so that's what really makes me nervous. Um, and then the second thing is, I do think, so let's say you were able to buy ketamine and you knew it was ketamine, you're 100% sure. And then you take that ketamine, it, you know, theoretically would have the antidepressant effect and the biologic effects. But I don't really think that's where the true power of it is. I think the true power is using it as a catalyst and giving you everything else you need, all the therapy, all the skills you need to make your life better. And doing it recreationally, like you're just not going to get that. And so um, it probably, if it's ketamine, it probably does have some effects um, biologically that could be beneficial. Um, but I don't think you anyone's getting um, great outcomes um, from that, unfortunately. I mean, if they could, it'd be great. Uh, I believe in whatever works, but I just don't think it would work. You know, I'm listening to you talk and you're saying it gives you what you need. And I'm listening and I'm thinking maybe it takes away what you don't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, we got another comment coming in here. Claudia says, once the ketamine is administered and ex the experience or session is over, is there a debriefing with a clinician or counselor following the treatment? Mm -hmm. So we have a unique model at the Newly. What we do is at the end of your um, individual session, we bring you to what is called um, a Zen room. Uh, and in the Zen room, um, it's a group setting. So other people who have just gone through treatment are there as well. And we have two, we have a quiet room and a talking room. Um, and so you have several options available to you because we find everyone's a little bit unique. Some people just want to close their eyes and spend more time reflecting inwardly. Some people want to journal. Some people want to listen to like breathing exercises or guided meditations. Um, and people who need that, they go to the quiet room. Um, the other thing I should say is that it's not like you're this type of person who always needs the quiet room. Every experience is a little different. What you need after each experience changes based on where you went, what you did, and where you're at now. Um, so that's the quiet room. And then if you're feeling like you need to talk, um, we, you go to the, um, you know, the other Zen room where you can, where you can chat. And in that Zen room, there's always a psychologist who's there to, um, help guide and lead a discussion. And we actually find some of the most powerful healing comes when, um, people who have both just experienced ketamine talk to each other. And the psych uh, psychologist is always there, um, to help support and guide the conversation, make sure that it's productive. It doesn't take away. And the last thing is if anyone needs, um, they're like, I got to talk to someone about this and I don't want to talk to someone else who just had ketamine, I want to talk to a professional, um, that psychologist or one of our nurses. Uh, so there's always three people when eight people are being treated, three people available. Um, we'll take you aside back to your treatment space um, and debrief with you what needs to be debriefed. And so a lot of ketamine or you know, clinics that provide ketamine treatment have like a dedicated um, three hour session with a psychologist the whole time. But truthfully, most of that time is spent um, not talking, looking inwardly. And a lot of people ask the psychologist to leave because they want to be alone. Um, so what we do is try to give people what they need um, and try to have those resources available um, to fit every individual's need. So long and short, yeah, for sure, there's someone there to talk to you um, if you want to talk to them. If there's other things that you need to do, um, we encourage you to do that. Got another one coming in here from Denise. Thank you for the quest or for the question, Denise. Denise asks, are you publicly funded or private? We tried very hard to do this in the public setting, um, but there were, uh, you know, there's red tape everywhere. We we're getting shut down everywhere. Um, so our model is uh, such that some of it is publicly funded in that like a, an assessment by a psychiatrist, like all psychiatrist assessments are publicly funded. Um, but the treatment protocol itself is private. So there's different ways it can be paid for. It can be paid for through private insurance. Um, that'll cover a bunch of stuff, like a lot of the psychology time. Um, for certain groups of populations like veterans, uh, RCMP, uh, refugees, people who are covered by uh, MediV Blue Cross. MediV Blue Cross does cover our services. So there's a large proportion of patients who do have full coverage for us and patients who generally need, um, need the support. And then finally, um, we do, at least in Alberta, work with WCB, um, so Workers' Compensation Board, and we're in active talks with WSIB in Ontario, WorkSafe BC. We're in active talks with um, similar bodies across the country um, to set up programs. And exactly what's available varies by province and um, the WCB board. Um, and so 
like what we can offer changes a little bit everywhere. Um, but we do, um, I don't like the idea of like making people pay for treatment. I want to be able to treat everyone I can. Um, so we're, uh, you know, working really hard with uh, these insuring bodies um, to get coverage. And, you know, the dream is one day this will all be covered by, um, you know, Alberta Health or, you know, the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Uh, ideally, this would all just be publicly funded. Uh, right now, unfortunately, uh, we're unable to do it that way. Got another one here. Angie chiming in. Thank you, Angie. Angie asks, are you going to do any pro bono work? Yeah, we do pro bono work. Um, so we're committed uh, to approximately, you know, five to 10% of our patients are pro bono. Um, and so, yeah, we have an active pro bono project. Um, our, we have pro bono patients being treated right now. And, you know, my dream is to um, get this going um, and have enough volume of patients um, that we can sponsor more and more and more people who need it. And so that's, you know, that's, a, um, that's where I want to take this. Okay. We've got Wilmina. Wilmina asks, are people on opioid agonist therapies eligible for ketamine treatment? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and we will even, you know, we have addiction physicians. Um, we will even start opioid agonist therapy, um, help people stabilize, and then start their ketamine treatment. So that we're not just treating the mu receptors, you know, not just the physical. Um, we're helping you get to the root of the problem, helping you get to the core. And so 100% people on opioid agonist therapies can absolutely come to our program. We've got Joey chiming in. Joey asks, what is the cost for this treatment? It's quite variable. Um, so it depends on exactly what um, package it is. Uh, you know, if it's like just um, ketamine and trauma therapy versus a uh, complete IOP, which is really the, the optimal type of therapy. Um, and there's, a, there's quite a large range. And, you know, if you need um, like kinesiology, physiotherapy, return to work training, um, you know, over a 12-week period, uh, the cost is a lot higher than if you need um, ketamine and therapy at the time plus trauma therapy, the cost is substantially lower. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there's a range. I think our, our least expensive option, um, if you're paying for everything, and this would also, you know, you get your psychiatry assessment, your medical assessment, everything titrated, because that's all covered through the government. Um, so, you know, that altogether, our lowest options are in the sort of like two to $3,000 range for like a few uh, shorter uh, session package. And for the like, meal deal, you're seeing kinesiologists, you're getting 150 hours of therapy, you're in our program for 12 weeks, um, for like everything, everything, everything. I think the mat, I think it tops out at 13 or 14. I, I don't want to uh, misspeak, but it's somewhere in 13, $14,000 kind of range. Mm -hmm. um, and then the typical IOP is around nine or 10. Um, I don't want to misspeak. Truthfully, the money side is really not where I put my time. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I'm not that familiar with the price list. Um, I'm really focused on the best possible treatment. And I don't, I don't, I, those are like the rough numbers, but I don't want to misspeak. Um, and if anyone's interested, they can uh, go to our website, um, call and get a pricing package sent to them. Uh, Cause I, I just don't want to misquote the, uh, the numbers, but you can get the pricing package sent to you and, and uh, talk about what insurance is covered where and, and go from there. Mackenzie asks, Thank you for the question, Mackenzie. What about patients with concurrent disorders? What may disqualify patients from partaking in these studies? Um, great question. You know, it, there are contraindications to ketamine. And so things like if you, you know, um, have a high, or ketamine makes your blood pressure go up. So if you have a disease that's gonna crank up your blood pressure, um, and that could cause problems like ketamine makes your blood pressure go up by 12 points. Um, but if that was risky for you, for most people, it's not right. Like blood pressure go up and down every day. But if you have like an aneurysm in your head, that's sort of like waiting to burst, uh, that blood pressure might be dangerous. And so there are diseases that are contraindications, um, such as aneurysmal vascular disease. Um, as far as concurrent mental health uh, disorders, uh, we are, you know, it is really up to the treating psychiatrist to decide if you would be a good fit for therapy or not. We don't want people paying money for something that's not going to work, right? And so we want people who are likely to benefit from treatment coming through. Um, we're not interested in um, providing treatment if someone is unlikely to benefit. So as far as like surrounding mental health problems, um, most people are likely eligible. But uh, I can't say like anyone can come and get it because you really want to treat people who will benefit. 
We've got a question coming in here from Terry, and I have to say I am really interested to hear what you have to say about this one because I know what it can be like in the rooms of recovery. Oh, it doesn't show up. I can read it out. Terry asks, so in the rooms of recovery, I am in, I have been taught absolute abstinence. So if someone came into your center and started therapy with ketamine, would that fire up the addiction all over again? Does that make sense? She's looking for some help here. Yeah, I understand the uh, the question. Um, I don't think so. Uh, you know, everyone is different, but truthfully, people don't come in and receive ketamine therapy to escape from their problems. They come in and receive ketamine therapy to dive into their problems. Um, and so I think it's unlikely that experiencing an altered state of consciousness with a goal to dive in and address your issues is going to lead you to um, relapse. I think it's more likely it's going to make you um, understand yourself better, understand your subconscious, and more likely um, to lead to, um, you know, um, persistent um, abstinence. And so, you know, we also offer um, long-term addiction programs, like phase three addiction programs, um, where we uh, work with people over the course of a full year. And so if you've had ketamine um, treatment year and you want to, uh, you know, continue to work on addiction issues, stay in our phase three program for a year, um, you know, all the support is there um, for relapse prevention. And so I don't, I don't think it's a risk. And in fact, ketamine has been shown to really decrease um, addiction in certain studies. And so I think it's unlikely. Um, but if that was a major concern um, for you personally, then I would say like, that's okay. Like there's, there's other treatment options. You know, this isn't like it's the only thing. Um, so it's not a perfect fit for everyone. For some people, it's great. For others, maybe it's not a good fit. And there's like, don't feel like, you know, oh, I got to have ketamine. That's the only thing that could work for me. It's like one of many options. We have Denise. Denise says, my addict tried the psilocybin route. How is this effective for addiction? He ended up going back to his usual drugs of choice. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there, there are studies on psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. So, uh, again, um, I don't know if the mushrooms were in a therapeutic setting or, or not. Um, and you know, the, the key to getting better using mushrooms is the surrounding therapy. So you have to, um, think about your issues. You have to come in setting intentions. You have to go through the session, um, with this in mind, you should be there with trained psychologists and guides, um, to bring you to the right places. And if you're taking mushrooms like on your own, you're unlikely to get that same therapeutic benefit. It's not the mushrooms that are the cure. It's the whole thing the wraparound care that is making people better. And truthfully, it works pretty well. So like there's some cool studies in smoking um, and they took a bunch of people smoking, couldn't quit, tried everything, Champix, whatever, they tried it all. Um, and 80% of people quit smoking. Um, and that was it a month. And then a year later, 65% had still quit. Like nothing does that. Nothing is that effective. Something like Champix is like 20% abstinence rates. This is for, for nicotine. But you know, 65% in a year is unheard of. Um, so there's something there. I'm not saying it works for everyone. Like nothing works for everyone. There's no magic pill, but there's something there. And it, if done in the right context, therapeutically, um, it can be incredibly effective for treating addiction. We have Angie chiming in one again, once again, Angie asks, would this work to treat obesity? It's a great question. Um, so, uh, the, the scientific answer is we don't know if it works for obesity or not. Um, but there are studies being done right now looking at that. And also on the other end of the spectrum to treat eating disorders. And truthfully, you know, most obesity is um, like an addiction. It's, it's, you know, instead of that smoke makes me feel better, it's like, you know, um, eating makes me feel better. Um, and, you know, I, I treat my feelings with food. Um, and so, you know, it's in my mind, um, obesity is usually uh, basically on the addiction spectrum. And I think it probably would, but I don't, I don't know it would because it hasn't been studied or proven. So I can't say if it works or not, but I think there's something there. Um, and it's something I would love to study. Jessica asks, thank you, Jessica, for the question. Would you treat people who are actively using drugs or do they need to have a period of sobriety first? Um, you can come to our clinic actively using. Now, before you start ketamine treatment, we want to help stabilize. And so, you know, 
ketamine plus ketamine super safe but if you combine ketamine with other drugs it may not be as safe and you know we want to make sure that we don't ever harm any patients you know any of the people who come to us um we want to make you better we don't want to harm you and so what we do offer are full addiction consults wraparound addiction care and services um and part of that may be ketamine uh, when the timing is right um so you don't have to be sober um you know or abstinent before you come to see us um you can sign up tomorrow and we will um bring you in with open arms and help you manage your addictions um and when the timing is right ketamine therapy may, may be part of your plan it may not be depending on the, the specific case claudia asks how do you work with people with adhd uh, yeah, we have patients with ADHD, lots of patients with ADHD. We generally actually tell people not to take their Vyvanse or Adderall or, you know, their stimulant the morning of the ketamine um, because we want your, your mind to be like a blank canvas, a clean slate. And so we generally, um, we generally advise against um, using a stimulant the morning of a ketamine treatment session, but otherwise it really doesn't, doesn't change anything. Um, you know, happy to treat um, people with ADHD. Now I should say, um, I'm not aware of any studies that say like ketamine therapy, makes ADHD better. I've never seen a study that looks to answer that question. So I don't know if it helps for ADHD or not, but if someone has ADHD and depression, you know, treatment resistant depression, there's no reason that it wouldn't help. Okay. We have a question coming in from Derek. Uh, Derek asks, I have prefrontal cortex wide scale across the lobe. As far as I'm concerned, Stimulants seem to help. Is this illusory? I'm talking about the bad shit. Serious question. Um, I am not sure I fully understand the question, to be honest. Mm. I think what you're saying is that you feel that your prefrontal cortex has been like downregulated, shrunk, like the effects of chronic stress and trauma have affected your brain like that, and stimulants seem to um, bring it back. Um, I, I think that's kind of what you're, what you're getting oh, wait, at. Wait, wait, sorry. Yeah, no, he, he left out damage. So now it, hopefully I have damage, prefrontal yeah, wide, cortex yeah. damage, wide scale. There we go. Now it makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I think that if you, if you think that way, you probably do, you probably do have, um, you know, changes in your medial prefrontal cortex. If you've experienced trauma. If you've experienced, you know, chronic stress, uh, you probably have changes in your medial prefrontal cortex. Um, I think there are proven ways to treat that, proven ways to make that better. One of which is ketamine. Other other ways are, are trauma therapy. There, there's other things that do make those changes happen. Um, and I think the best thing to do is to focus on what we know works um, in, instead of sort of, um, treating yourself with something that may or may not work. I don't, I, I'm not saying it works or not, but um, there are certainly risks to, you know, treating yourself with other stimulants. Um, and I, I guess I was just worried about the risks um, in the absence of like a, a clear benefit. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a scientist. Um, I kind of like to go with what's uh, been proven. And so I'm like, mm, hesitant to endorse um, something where I, I'm not sure what stimulants uh, you're using it or exactly why or what a diagnosis might be. Um, I suspect they may make you feel better um, during the use of the stimulant and worse in between. Um, and, I, and I would worry about that, the long-term um, kind of consequences of that. Cool. We've got another one from Wilmina. Is this treatment for adults only or are teens eligible? Uh, we are developing an adolescent program. Right now, um, it's uh, 16 and over is what we'll treat. And so uh, younger teens are currently excluded um, as we develop these uh, adolescent protocols. Hey, okay, we've got one here from Carla. Carla asks, what about antipsychotics? Could someone who takes these use ketamine treatment? Yep, yep, for sure. There's no, uh, there's no interactions. We have a toxicologist. There's only like 12 toxicologists in Canada. And they're the best at looking at drug interactions and safety profiles. Um, and our toxicologist, Dr. McGillis, has done a comprehensive review of ketamine in every potential interaction. We have a six-page document uh, outlining everything and every possible drug interaction. And antipsychotics are not on the list. It's safe to have antipsychotics um, as well as ketamine. Okay. Well, the questions have died down. Um, cool. 
Is there anything that you would like to leave us with tonight? Um, yeah, I think I would just say that for anyone out there who has um, addiction issues or substance use issues, you know, if you're in recovery, if you're considering recovery, what I want you to know is that you are not your disease. A lot of addiction treatment has kind of got it wrong. The goal is not sobriety. The goal is to love yourself so much that you don't have to use. I just want to leave that with you. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for answering all of our questions and for bringing some truth to the airwaves, waves. <laughs> <laughs> so we will let you go. Take care, my friend. Well, thanks for having me on, Dan. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. You're very welcome. There is power in numbers. If you would like to contribute to ending the stigma around emotional pain, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Like and comment your thoughts on our posts. Let us come together with our lived and living experience as a resource that has the power to engage new thought processes, to promote new ideas, to broaden the spectrum of care, and to show the world that the lie is dead. We do recover, and we're here to show you how. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.